So today I'd like to do my first book talk on this channel. This is something that won't be a very common video on my channel, however, if I do finish reading a book that I enjoyed or didn't enjoy so much or just go back to a favorite that I really want to discuss with you guys, I do want to talk a little bit about literature on this channel. So for this first book talk, I decided to do the book that I just finished this weekend for the second time. It's one of my all-time favorite books, and that is OK For Now by Gary D. Schmidt. So I'll just start off with a summary and whether I recommend it or not, and then I will go into more detail and there'll probably be spoilers in that section, but first, uh, spoiler free. So OK For Now is a book about a boy named Doug Sweetek who moves into a small New York town in upstate New York uh, in the late 60s. Doug's home life isn't very good with his family, he hates his new town, and kind of struggles to adapt to a new situation. However, over the course of the book, he has to learn to deal with this and a coming-of-age kind of classic story. So obviously, as I said in the beginning, I do recommend this book. It's one of my all-time favorites. If you have not read it, I do recommend you go read it. It's an easy read, a, a lower level, I would say. I mean, I read it for the first time in seventh grade, and I'm not a good reader uh, or advanced reader at all. So it should be something you can get through pretty fast, and I do recommend it. So now we're going to get into the more spoiler section, going into a little bit more detail. So if you haven't read it, uh, thank you for watching thus far. So obviously, one of the things I really liked about this book was the bird. And the way that, and the way that the books in John James Audubon's books really reflect Doug, and obviously have a symbolic value to whatever Doug's going through at that time. I think that's obviously one of the more interesting and cooler aspects of this. I think it really kind of shows the power that art can have—not just art as in painting, but art as in anything with artistic value, storytelling, etc. Anything that can emotionally connect to somebody and make them think about what they're feeling and think about how others have felt that before is extremely powerful and we see that here as Doug struggles to cope with his upbringing but is able to kind of see himself in these birds. I like the way that the birds also kind of change throughout the story. Um, for example, in the beginning he sees the arctic turn falling but in the later he sees him flying it. But in the end, he realizes he's flying wherever he wants to go. And I think that was really touching, really cool. And throughout the book, these birds serve as our insight into Doug. I also love how Doug sees the Birds of America, the book with all the birds in it, as kind of his way to achieve something perfect. That even though his life sucks, his home life is terrible, that the ability to get all the birds back into that book, the, you know, the plates that got removed, if he can do that, he can have something that is perfect. And it's, that's what makes it really powerful and interesting in the end when, when he's still missing one of the plates and he realizes that nothing is really perfect. And Mr. Powell says to him, um, nothing is ever perfect, but this comes pretty close. So I really like that idea of Doug learning that the reality of the world is that nothing is going to be perfect, but you can work towards making it close, but accepting the idea that but accepting the idea that nothing is ever going to be perfect and great and 100% good forever. And that probably goes into one of my favorite aspects of the book, and that is the cycle of good and bad. Throughout the book, there's a constant cycle of Doug's life being good, and then once it's really good, it's really bad. And then once everything is at its lowest, it picks up again, and then once it feels like he's finally out of that darkness, he gets bad again. And I think that's also the crux of the book, that nothing is ever perfect. And I think it's a relatable feeling that when something's getting good and you finally feel like you're getting your life together, it, it, things go bad. That that's just life and that you have to continue to have strong wings. So this cycle of good and bad also kind of goes into expectations versus reality and growing up. As Doug kind of learns what expectations and what they actually end up being, whether it be going to Marysville, his new new home, and thinking it's going to be terrible and then realizing it's actually his favorite place in the whole world, or just the expectation of life being perfect and realizing that in reality life is never perfect. So it's kind of this coming of age story as Doug kind of learns to realize that there's going to be good and bad and realizes and understands expectations a little better. So I think one of the things that I also really love about this book is the writing. Um, sometimes when you're reading a book, do you ever feel that feeling where you almost feel the weight of the writing, the impact that it's having, that you feel like the writer, when he was writing it, realized how beautiful and important what he was saying was? I definitely get that here from Gary D. Schmidt. 
and I think that's an important book, and you feel it a lot throughout, and normally it's better in smaller bits, but here somehow it, it really works with being kind of this weighty story throughout the entire book. Um, I wish I kind of could explain it better, but if you read it, I feel like you'll know what I'm talking about. And his writing also goes into creating great settings. I think, obviously, he does a phenomenal job with the characters and being able to give insight through birds and through symbolism and all that. But he also is able to create Marysville and really create this, this 60s setting very well. I love his seasons. You really feel the warm of the sun and the cold cokes and all that. And you feel the winter and the sludging through the snow and the cold in upstate New York. I think both those really blend together and kind of create this 1960s classic American suburb New York feel, and I think that really gives this story, not only is it a classic tale, but this also gives this story a classic setting and area and just kind of elevates it a little more. Other highlights from the story also include a lot of the character interactions. Uh, I'll go, just go through a couple here. Lil and Doug is probably the most standout one here. It's another classic story of a 14-year-old boy, and he falls in love with this girl that kind of is the only one to accept him at first, even though their relationship is a little more, you know, a slap on the shoulder, kind of fun, they like to tease each other. Their relationship is definitely one of the more fun things about this novel, seeing it grow and seeing Doug be there for Lil at the end when Lil was there for Doug in the beginning, and you really buy into their relationship, and that's just a lot of fun. Um, another really standout relationship is definitely the gym teacher and Lucas scene. The gym teacher is a sergeant from Vietnam. He's Doug's gym teacher, and he's kind of an asshole in the beginning of the story. Lucas, on the other hand, is Doug's brother, and he comes back from Vietnam partway through, almost blind, missing his legs, and... Just seeing both these characters have to go through the struggle of PTSD and kind of seeing that is really interesting. And then seeing them come together and kind of talk it out in the end was also kind of touching. And you realize the importance that we can have on each other, similar to the way Audubon and Lil were able to help Doug. Uh, the gym teacher and Lucas can help each other. I read OK For Now for the first time in seventh grade as well. And it was also really insightful to see how some war veterans from Vietnam obviously weren't treated as well. Because um, growing up, you have this vision of veterans being, you know, beloved when they return from war. Um, you know, you kind of envision the World War II type of return. Or, you know, in our modern times, you know, we really value um, the military service and veterans coming back. But Vietnam was different. It was the first time people really started to get a taste of what war was like. And just learning about the fact that not every veteran was treated well and learning about that Vietnam era, something I just didn't really know much about at the time, was really interesting and insightful and helped me to grow as a person and myself. There is a lot of other good uh, relationships um, that also go to show expectation versus reality. Um, Mrs. Windermere and Mr. Big Bucks Ballard are both at first, to Doug, seem like bad people from the outside just because of what he hears other people say about them, but actually become two of his more mentor figures and two kind of rocks he can lean on throughout the story, which help to exemplify expectation versus reality and serve as two more interesting relationships and seeing these characters kind of get to know each other. And Doug to have some adults in his life that he can lean on is really interesting and good to see. There's a lot more symbolism in this novel I wish it could go through. Um, for example, Doug serves as a delivery boy for Lil's dad's deli owner, as you guys probably know. And the reception he gets at each of the houses kind of um, mirrors the situation he's in at the time or how he's feeling. For example, how many donuts he gets at one of the ladies' houses normally ties in with how, what he's feeling at that point in the story. If he gets two dozen donuts, things are going really good, but when things are going bad, he doesn't have it, she doesn't have any donuts that week. So I think, you know, obviously each house has its own thing, and that was fun to see. There's a ton more symbolism going in with his signed baseball and his jacket, and there's just a lot to love here, and Schmidt kind of gives a lot of focus 
on these symbols and really helps it to tell a story. It doesn't feel like they're symbols for the sake of being, ooh, check out my symbols. You know what I mean? Kind of the school, classic school examples where you're like, really? I, I don't see that. You, the, the symbols are actually used throughout the story to really help tell the story and kind of help him to show don't tell which can be very difficult in writing sometimes sometimes you see authors because they can tell don't show but here schmidt really help uses those symbols to help him show don't tell and it creates a, a deeper connection with the characters and provides more insight so those are all kind of things i loved and kind of my my outlook into the story there isn't really a ton that comes to mind that I dislike, nothing I'm really going to talk about here, not that it's perfect by any means, nothing's perfect, but it is one of my favorite stories of all time. I had a blast rereading it, I could go on and on and would love to, but I, I don't want this video to be super long, I just kind of want to give an outlook touch on some things, some of my favorite aspects of the story. I'd love to hear some comments from people that have read it or people that see this and go read it. Please leave a comment. Is there something you disagree with that I said? Is there something more you'd like to add to what I said? I'd love to have a conversation about this book, make it into more of a book talk and less of a book lecture. So thank you so much for watching if you watch this time. Uh, let me know if you want to see more of these from more books in the future as this is something new I'm doing. And uh, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys next time.